to the limited edition leadership show. My name is Paula Dunn and I'm a teenage resilience expert and cognitive scientist. I work with teams to help them create confidence to conquer life. If you're a parent seeking alternate, alternative options to counselling and psychology to help your team create confidence, courage and certainty to thrive in this uncertain world, please reach out to me. Today, I'd love to introduce you to the fabulous Tracy Jewell. Most of you would know, recognise Tracy from being on the reality TV show Married at First Sight. However, Tracy is more than just a TV celebrity. Tracy is an author, a marketing strategist, a copywriter, and professional speaker. And as well, she is an advocate for mental health initiatives. I've asked Tracy to come on the show today because we're heading towards Are You OK Day? And I wanted Tracy to share some of her personal insights into mental health so we can keep the conversation going beyond that particular day. So welcome, Tracy. Thanks for having me, Paula. It's amazing to be here for such a great cause. It's Are You OK Day? Thank you. Look, tell me about your time on maths and the impact it had on your mental health. Yeah, so when I went on maths, which is, I can't believe it, three years ago now, when, well, when, when it filmed, when it aired was two years ago, um, I hadn't really experienced mental health or anxiety or depression personally. Um, you know, I've always been a very optimistic person and, you know, always looking at the glass half full, although, you know, I had friends and family affected with it but it wasn't a personal journey. And going on the show, I felt quite strong going into it and quite clear on who I am as a person and, and you know, being true to myself. But I wasn't um, expecting, I guess, you know, the publicity of the show and the public backlash and all the opinions. And I think it really shook me um, and I developed generalised anxiety disorder because of the show, mm. um, kind of where my mental health journey kind of started from. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it, would have, it wouldn't have been easy. I mean, I know myself when I've started my business, um, how much visibility I had to uh, get comfortable with myself in showing up as who I am and my beliefs and what I stand for um, and whether that, um, you know, whether I got positive or negative reviews as a result of it. So I can, could only imagine the, the trauma you went through being on national television during that time. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And for me, the anxiety stemmed from just the uncertainty of it all. Mm. So, you know, living a life before maths, everything was pretty certain for me. I had a certain job and, you know, not everything certain in life, but it was a certainty I could resiliently handle. Mm. And then you turn into a different world where it was just uncertain everywhere, uncertain what people thought, felt, comments being thrown left, right and centre, what's going to be on the cover of New Idea next week. It was just a roller coaster of uncertainty that I just got more and more anxious and worried about that as the weeks rolled by. Yeah. Did you feel, did you feel that you had less control over how people saw you? Absolutely. I felt like my life wasn't my own anymore. And what was really interesting is I was okay while the show was airing because I was there in the filming. So I was quite comfortable with, you know, what I said, what I did on the show, but it was taking that, to that next level of everyone having an opinion of it and then suddenly my private life, you know, my daughter and my family being all over in the magazines, that's what felt out of control for me because I couldn't control that anymore. It kind of took a life of its own. Mm -hmm. Did you find that the show took, took um, what you thought that, that you were doing okay out of context? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they've only got an hour a night four episodes a week to show it and we film all day, every day. Mm. Um, so you never know. We didn't know before it was airing what would be shown and what wouldn't. Mm. So there was a lot of anxiety with that too, not knowing what that episode and what bits they were going to choose to show. But I was kind of a little bit lucky, unlike my counterpart, Dean, <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> yes, the bad boy. Yes, we all remember that one. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's quite relevant um, what you were going through on the show and and putting it so out there because a lot of teams that I work with have that um, inner concerns about their inner beliefs about you know how how they see themselves, how others see them, and how they want to be seen. And it's it's that that um, 
you know, cognitive dissonance between all three that causes that heightened stress levels and anxiety. And, you know, and for you putting it so so blatantly out there because of the media um, what was a really strong example of that. Yeah, I, I think cognitive dissonance is, is a great term because everyone goes through it, whether it's a new job as an adult, whether it's starting uni, starting a new school, there's always elements of out of our comfort zone. You know, and I like to think it's like your window of tolerance, right? And I've always had a pretty good window of tolerance, but being on that show just threw me so far outside my window. That, you know, and I was trying to find some tools for, as coping mechanisms that I just didn't have that level of, of skill set to be able to cope. Yeah. So, so you mentioned about there's um, tools that you, you didn't have those particular tools at the time. So what tools have you developed since then? What did you do to, to combat those, those feelings of uncertainty? Yeah, so when it was starting to happen, it got to the point where I didn't even know really what it was mm. before I went to seek professional help and, and realised I had anxiety. I didn't want to leave my house. I felt afraid all the time. And, you know, some of those, you know, were real fears, real, you know, real fears, and some were just perceived fears that it was just all in my head, really. And then I'd go to that event or go somewhere and it was, you know, it was completely fine. Um, so it was really hard to determine, I felt like, am I going crazy or do I actually have these things to be worried about? Mm -hmm. When I saw professional help, I went to a psychologist, um, you know, I went to even a psychiatrist. I went to a day program in a mental health centre for like cognitive behaviour therapy and was there I started to discover that, you know, I was ticking all these boxes of anxiety and as a personal choice, um, I didn't want to go down the medication route. I'm a very holistic person and, you know, medication definitely has its play to part, absolutely, for some people. But for me, what worked for me was mindfulness, being in the present moment, um, what's called radical acceptance in, in dialect or behaviour therapy. So accepting things for what it was and not fighting it. That was a massive learning curve for me because all I wanted was not to be feeling how I was feeling. Yeah. I wanted everything to be different. But if I couldn't accept how I was feeling and just like kind of own it, I was never going to be able to move forward. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's one of the biggest challenges us as human beings have, you know, it's that pleasure and pain where we're going, we want to get away from all the pain and the pain can be those, those negative beliefs, those negative feelings, those reactions to, to things that we can't control. Um, and we want to move towards pleasure where we just feel like, oh, thank goodness, you know, taking the pain away. And a lot of, and a lot of people resort to medication or um, other forms of addiction to, to mask, to mask the, um, the pain and so you know what you've done is is quite admirable and um you know taking the the most um you know holistic approach in seeking the seeking help and getting clear and clap on on those inner 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 my inner workings yeah and i think part of the process is, is just also accepting that something's not right and that this is real yeah. what we're going through mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes there's the external stigma of what are people going to think when I tell them I have anxiety. But also I think it's the internal stigma is, hang on a minute, I'm actually not okay. And being okay with not being okay yes. is, for me, it was for me one of the hardest hurdles to come across. And once I became okay and accepted that, that was a real starting point for me to be able to move forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, I think the... the I agree with you. It's it's making that decision and saying, okay, deciding within yourself that um, that you're not feeling okay, but you're willing to to be uncomfortable to get comfortable. Yes, and exactly. That, that external support in in ways in which is tailored to your specific needs is is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. So I understand that you're also a mental health first aider. So tell yeah. us about that. Yeah. So. Because of my experiences and, you know, I had a stigma around what anxiety was and is and how different it is for everyone and experiencing it firsthand, I thought I came across Mental Health First Aid. It was about March last year, so a year and a half now. And I thought, what a great organisation that not only is awareness and education, but is helping people with the skills to be able to help others 
in a first aid response to mental health. So you don't have to be a psychologist, you don't have to be a counsellor, but you can learn enough, like just like in first aid, doctors A, B, C, D, you can learn enough to help someone if they're experiencing a panic attack, if they have the signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression or, you know, suicidal, non-suicidal behaviours. You can look for their signs and symptoms, you know what they are and you know how to help them in that initial conversation and encourage them to seek support. And I thought... This is amazing. I want to be involved. I love teaching. Um, and it was a way to kind of dip my toe um, into the me mental health um, field to be able to help people. Yeah, yeah. And it's very practical, isn't it? Like pretty much immediately as soon as you're, you're qualified. Yeah, it's a two-day course. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, you know, you're a mental health first aider for three years, um, similar to first aid, and you have the tools and skills ready to go and start having those mental health first aid conversation. Great. And who do you work with specifically? So with Mental Health First Aid Australia, we're all contractors. I work a lot um, with corporates, so officers that like me to come in, so their whole organisation are mental health first aiders, which I just think is amazing um, for our companies to do that. So I work a lot in the private sector as well as charities and not-for-profits. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. And I understand you've also got some uh, another little business. Tell us more about that one. Yeah, so um, I've just started an initiative called Up Self, and through my anxiety journey, one of the biggest tools I've learned is how important self-care is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about self-care, getting a facial or a massage. I'm talking some more like inner work self-care, so not being afraid to journal your feelings, for example, or spend some time with yourself. Um, and I became extremely passionate about this process of self-care, so much so that sometimes we do need those little nice tools um, and little gifts um, to help us through that process. So UpSelf has created um, self-care kits, which are all really well-priced and, and we donate money to mental health initiatives. Um, and it's just like a little toolkit to help you on that self-care journey. Oh, that's wonderful. All right. If people want to know, learn more about, uh, you know, getting in touch with you uh, for mental health first aid or public speaking or um, getting some of those self-care kits, where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram, Tracy Jewel Lafay, and um, just hit me up a DM or an email and I'm more than happy to have a conversation and help any way I can. Oh, that's wonderful. So there you have it. So, Tracy, Jewel, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's the been a great conversation. The pleasure. <laughs> if you've enjoyed watching this segment, please like and share and subscribe. And don't forget to be you, have courage, and live life without limits. I'm Paula Dunn. Bye for now. Cool. Awesome. Thanks.